Now I extend a welcome to you. Uh, my name is Dr. Wendy Scaife and I'm the director of the Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies. Delighted to be here for the third of our sessions around the Association's Incorporation Regulation 1999. And as always, we would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which we are meeting. And here at QUT, it is the Turbal and Yugara peoples, the First Nation owners of the lands where QUT now stands. We pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits and recognise that these spaces here, these beautiful spaces, have always been places of teaching, research and learning. And QUT acknowledges the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QUT and wider community. And we're delighted today to have a range of presenters for you and I'm going to be introducing and passing across to Linda Lavarch. And Linda, you will um, um, know well Linda's background. Linda, of course, at QUT has been a long-term advisory board member, past research fellow with us, and uh, of course had an extensive career as an MP and was in fact the Minister for Justice and Attorney General for Queensland and on a national level has held uh, roles such as chairing the Not-for-Profit Reform Council uh, for, uh, uh, for some time and of course many roles within boards as well. So Linda, I'll pass across to you to, um, to set up our day. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And a warm welcome to um, everyone who's joined us on the webinar today. As Wendy um, has said, today is the third of our women webinars um, that um, it, um, have the purpose of discussing the consultation papers put out by the Department of Justice and Attorney General, Office of Regulatory Policy on um, in relation to the Associations um, Incorporations Act and the Collections Act. Today's paper is in is reporting requirements and thresholds. The outline um, for today's webinar is that we'll be, there'll be five parts um, that will be presented by Hannah Hiscox and Miles McGregor Lowndes, Emeritus Professor Miles McGregor Lowndes. The Miles will um, kick off and provide us with a legislative overview and background to the consultation um, on the options and um, details for the regulations. Hannah will present um, on the thresholds and um, reporting issues, and she will do this in three parts. Part one, we're looking at the revenue thresholds. Part two, look at, looking at the asset thresholds. And part three, considering the reporting requirements under the Collections Act. Then Miles will, um, um, he will conclude our webinar, our webinar today by um, discussing the financial documents that must be retained um, by associations or organisations under the Collections Act. So um, the webinar is being um, recorded and as always, be careful uh, what you say and, and um, what you put in the text, it's, it's all recorded. During the webinar, We'll be asking questions and these questions will follow the um, questions um, asked in the consultation papers and we're doing this by our poll facility in Zoom. The, uh, the question will pop up on your screen and if you could, they're multiple choice, and if you could tick the box um, that aligns with your views, that would be really great. We will be having a test or mock poll question, just to kick off to get used to that facility. There's also the ability to ask questions after each of the um, parts that are being presented. If you've got a question, if you could just um, type that into the chat facility and we'll pick up those um, questions along the way. To assist us in uh, today and, and answering your questions or receiving any comments or suggestions, um, in relation to the matters in the consultation paper. We are um, joined by Martin Scott uh, from the Office of Regulatory Policy. So welcome, Martin, and thank you for, for being with us today. So I will hand over to Emeritus Professor Miles McGregor Lowndes um, just to um, set the scene and give us the background on this consultation paper. Thank you, Miles. 
Welcome everybody and delighted that you could uh, join us today. Um, so we're here today to discuss a consultation proposed by the department about the regulations to the Incorporated Associations Act and the Collections Act. Um, the Associations Act was uh, amended significantly about two years ago and that passed through Parliament. Uh, but COVID got in the way of making the regulations and particularly consulting uh, about the form of the regulations. So here we are today uh, and the department has issued three papers uh, on topics regarding the regulations um, and uh, is seeking input from the sector and the Queensland public. Uh, so if you have a copy of the paper available, that's the third paper on uh, thresholds uh, and disclosure issues. Uh, it will be helpful and particularly um, at the end, table five, um, you'll probably need to refer to table five uh, at the end. So if you have that open on a double screen or in a hard copy, um, that would be fine. So it's um, we're discussing the regulations or proposed regulations today. Uh, too bad, too sad if you don't like the uh, reforms, the amendments to the Incorporated Associations Act, uh, that's for another day. We're just here about the regulations. And I'm particularly um, sad about that because I'd love to see the reform of the Collections Act. Um, it's uh, well overdue, um, passed before man or even woman step foot on the moon and uh, drawing uh, liberally from the 1903 Metropolitan Streets Act London, which I'll explain a little later on. Uh, so um, the Collections Act, my favourite act to hate and want to be reformed, and uh, I get to talk about that at the end. Uh, so um, uh, we all ready uh, to kick off. Uh, this is about the regulations and three, uh, particularly the policy issues are should we align our, our uh, proportionate uh, reporting uh, levels uh, for incorporated associations with that of other states or the ACNC? So they're all in step. Uh, and then particularly um, what financial records uh, must be retained uh, by the uh, incorporated association and also by those who are fundraising in Queensland. Um, so over to, um, to Hannah for the first part of the paper. Let me introduce Hannah to, um, to everyone today. Hannah Hiscox is a partner, Audit and Assurance at Grand Thornton. Um, Hannah's been with Grand Thornton for over 20 years and she focuses solely on the not-for-profit sector. So we're very fortunate to have the benefit of Hannah's expertise, specialist knowledge and insights into the not-for-profit sector in presenting today. Thank you, Hannah. Well, thank you, Linda. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and, and talking about these important changes um, that are ahead for Queensland's incorporated associations. Um, I think from an audit, putting my auditor's hat on, this one will be of great interest uh, to the sector, um, particularly those smaller associations which might have found it a little difficult um, to find an auditor and particularly um, one that fits at their price point, I think. Um, the auditing and accounting standards have only gotten more complex over the years and so the, we've seen the cost of those sort of things go up. And so hopefully there's an opportunity to, to see some relief ahead uh, in that space. So um, even as an auditor uh, with 20 years experience working with not-for-profits, um, it is a bit of a complicated decision tree when you are looking at what the external verification requirements are. Um, the first place I start is what legal structure um, your organisation has. And so that's an easy one today because we're here to talk about uh, Queensland Incorporated Associations. So on this table uh, here, we're looking at what the reporting thresholds are at the moment. And so Incorporated Associations um, as a legal structure is that second um, pale line there. And it's uh, we've got two columns to the right-hand side, which talks about when you hit that minimum uh, threshold of a review and when you hit that minimum threshold for an audit. And so in, in a lot of uh, jurisdictions that is referred to as medium or large, 
Um, and they are, we do put minimum at the top there because it is a minimum requirement. You can always choose to, to go to a higher level of verification or you might have a reason um, such as a funding instrument or your constitution, uh, rules of association that would lead you down that path as well. So if we firstly look at the incorporated associations as a legal structure, we know that uh, small entities, so that's one which don't have a minimum review or audit, have annual revenue that's less than $20,000 and annual current uh, and current assets at balance date of less than $20,000. So you need both of those. Uh, to tip you into a review requirement, the medium size, you'll have either annual revenue between $20,000 and $100,000 or uh, current assets between $20,000 and $100,000 or you could have both in that range. The highest category then, the large category, is where you have annual revenue that's over $100,000 or annual current assets which are over $100,000. And so that deals with the legal structure. There's two, um, I guess, common other pathways or registrations that would tip you into a slightly different approach. And so if we look at the first one there, which is the top line, the fundraisers, um, if your organisation does fundraise in Queensland um, in a way that means you need to be registered under the Collections Act, which Miles was referring to, um, there is a, the fundraising authority says that there is no uh, threshold. So all of those organisations will require that maximum assurance, which is an audit. The other common exemption, um, or and it's a recent change, is that if your incorporated association is registered with the ACNC, they're now classed as an exempt entity. Their thresholds would then apply to your association instead of those um, under the Incorporated Associations Act. And so they've had some recent changes as well. And so both of those are presented here. Uh, the way that we look at how to determine the, the verification requirements for ACNC charities is um, solely based on annual revenue. They don't have an asset threshold. And it uh, changed in July this year as well. So for FY21 or uh, years ending in 2021, uh, the minimum for a review or a medium charity was $250,000 to a $1 million uh, revenue. And that actually increased um, from 1 July this year to be between $500,000 and $3 million. Once you tip over that $3 million mark, uh, you are required to have an audit. And if you are below either of those benchmarks there, so $250,000 in 2021, and 500,000 in 2022, you are classified as small and there is no minimum uh, financial reporting to ACNC or audit or review requirement. All this, uh, tempering all of this, all the external verification requirements, um, we do note there that all associations, including the small ones, have to present their financial statements to the members at the AGM for adoption. And that needs to be within six months uh, of the end of the financial year. And so if you're a 30 June association, that would be by uh, 31 December. And you do need to lodge um, the various documents uh, required of you with the OFT uh, within one month of that AGM. So that's the current state of play. If we then look uh, to what the options are being presented in the uh, consultation paper, uh, we're going to firstly look at the revenue threshold options. So 1A uh, is the status quo and that reflects the uh, current existing thresholds and it's not actually the preferred option. Uh, the 1B says uh, we tip into a review at 50,000 revenue and 250,000 plus would be uh, the requirement for an audit. And so this partially aligns uh, with the Northern Territory who have the review requirement um, at 25,000 and the audit requirement at 250,000. And in New South Wales, uh, they don't have the review requirement, but the 250,000 is their requirement for audit. Uh, option 1C there 
is 150,000 uh, minimum revenue to require a review and five, half a million dollars to require an audit. And that would be partially aligned with South Australia. They don't have the, the medium category, the review, they just tip into an audit at half a million. Option 1D would align with those 2021 ACNT, ACNC thresholds. Um, which would align us with the Victorian and West Australian uh, jurisdictions. And just for information there, that would uh, be expected to remove uh, the audit or review requirement for about 80% of Queensland's uh, incorporated associations. 1E uh, is the option that aligns with the current, the recently increased ACNC thresholds. And it's expected that that would remove uh, the audit and review requirements for some 90% of Queensland's incorporated associations. Uh, the final option is a write-in option. So uh, they are welcoming um, suggestions uh, for other thresholds um, and asking for some uh, justification of those views. Before we move on to the potential questions and polls, just wanted to run through um, I guess there would maybe a preference that 1D and 1E could be uh, preferred options that they are bigger thresholds. Um, but we just have a bit of a look at the factors we might need to think about uh, in whether we should or should not align with the ACNC. So if we just go on to the next slide, uh, please, Wendy. What we know or we can estimate is that only about 12% of Queensland's incorporated associations are registered charities. So that leaves um, the vast majority as non-exempt. And so the question becomes, should we align with the ACNC thresholds um, given the different circumstances uh, that those incorporated associations have compared to registered charities? And so one of those factors is that the public scrutiny is higher for ACNC registrants, uh, particularly in terms of the financial information they report and uh, the annual information statements, which is all publicly available on the charity register. And so it invites itself uh, to that public scrutiny. And then I guess the, the sense check element to it, is this what we think the public would expect carving out the audit and review requirements for at least 80% and if uh, under the, the new higher thresholds it would be up to 90% that may not have that requirement. However, there are counterpoints uh, that would support alignment with the ACNC and so that one of those is that it is consistent as we noted before with some other jurisdictions. There's also been some recent changes um, to the governance framework in Queensland which has tightened up some offences and things and, and powers uh, that we have to discipline um, uh, incorporated associations, I suppose, for not observing basic governance principles such as acting in good faith, disclosing conf conflicts of interest and uh, not trading while insolvent. So that, that gives us um, alignment uh, with some other jurisdictions and that might justify um, that, those higher ACNC thresholds as well. And finally, uh, the regulator will always retain the ability to seek financial information, and that can include audited financial information if they think um, that there's some serious concerns about the conduct of the entity uh, that would uh, lead them to take that course of action. So they're just some um, thoughts, I suppose, to consider if you're selecting 1D or 1E um, as to why you might or might not arrive at those positions. But over to you, Linda, for any questions and, and the poll. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I can't see any questions in the chat box at the, at the moment. And thank you for putting up um, the options um, that uh, are set out in the paper. So the poll asks, taking into account the information uh, which revenue threshold would do you consider to be the most appropriate uh, for uh, medium and large um, organisations? I've just got a question for Martin while you're completing that poll. 
Martin, of the um, incorporated associations in Queensland, how many now um, provide audited financial statements to the um, to your office? Uh, we estimate it's about 20%, uh, which must be about, what would that be, uh, 4,000? Okay. And of that 20%, how many would now be exempt from reporting because they're, a regist they're registered with the ACNC? 12%, uh, so you're testing my maths again, but uh, I would say uh, 2,600 or thereabouts. Okay. And are they one and the same or there'll be diff different? Oh, there'd be a, there'd be a mix, yeah. yeah. We were a bit limited in our ability to um, to produce stats of that order. This is all just an estimate provided by OFT. Um, if I can add some additional context to that discussion, is there time for that? Just about the... Uh, yes, of course, of course, Martin, yes. Well, I was just thinking, I guess the consideration, what, what we have in mind uh, in relation to the ACNC thresholds is that uh, incorporation, as you'd all be aware, and Miles would add to this, uh, bestows a legal identity upon an association and gives members of uh, the association indemnity for the association's debts and so forth. And ACNC registration doesn't do that. Um, as you'd be aware, charities register with the ACNC primarily for uh, uh, tax benefits from the ATO. Um, and the, AT the ACNC will never be required to wrap up an association and ensure its assets go to appropriate purposes. They'll have an interest in ensuring that they do, but it'll never be responsible for it uh, as far as I'm aware. Because uh, the loss of ACNC registration doesn't entail the loss of a legal identity. Um, so there may be an argument that lower than ACNC thresholds are justified in the oversight of incorporated associations, particularly when you're talking about potentially removing all external verification uh, from or not, you know, from ninety percent of the uh, of those incorporations. Uh, so the discussion, paid, the government policy, obviously, is to exempt uh, ACNC registrants from the local reporting requirements, and the discussion paper outlines some justification for that, uh, which Hannah's mentioned. Um, for example, the scrutiny of two regulators, the publication of uh, data, and the controls retained by OFT. Um, but at the end of the day. You know, we, we need to go to government with a recommendation and um, it would be really useful to have some, some further justification for uh, moving towards uh, ACNC thresholds, if that's what the sector wants, um, while being cognizant of the fact that we are removing all external verification for a very large portion of incorporated associations. Just appreciate some justification. Thank you, Martin. The um, part of this poll is that if your choice um, and, and what the um, what's um, being asked in the consultation paper, if, if your op preferred option is um, either option one D or one E, that which are the current um, and then the proposed um, thresholds for the ACNC, is there any information you can provide to assist that would justify? those higher thresholds and if you could just put that in in the chat or well, using text that would be great Hannah we might um, move on now to your um, your next um, session in relation to the asset thresholds yes no problem thanks Linda um, so this section of the consultation paper doesn't set look to set a number um, like we were just doing in the last poll on an asset threshold. Um, what it seeks to do is look at what the relative asset threshold would be compared to the, the revenue threshold that's set. And so this is a little comparison here between um, jurisdictions. And so you can see that Queensland is, um, I guess, something of an outlier that at the moment our uh, asset threshold is equal to the revenue threshold. In um, the two other jurisdictions that have an asset threshold, that's New South Wales and the Northern Territory, it is double the value of the revenue threshold. And that may, uh, for those of you that deal with corporations, um, that is um, the same as how you determine uh, whether a company is a large or, or small proprietary company. 
um, the majority of the jurisdictions there, and including the ACNC, which is, um, as Martin says, not a legal structure uh, regulator, it's a charity registrant regulator, they don't have an asset threshold. So if we look then um, to the options, oh, sorry, no, I think the first thing I was going to do was go through what, um, how we define assets at the, under this Act. So when we're talking about assets um, under the Act, uh, we talk about them as being current assets and it's defined to be uh, assets held by the association as at the end of its financial year other than real property or assets capable of depreciation. And it does include amounts held in financial institutions, stocks and debentures. So what that really means is it may not match your accounting uh, line items, the current assets, um, if some of those particularly investment portfolios and whatnot might be considered non-current under the standards. But examples uh, here include uh, for current assets, cash, receivables, prepayments, term deposits, um, and as I just mentioned, investments. And think of your non-current assets as being um, like your physical land and buildings, vehicles, plant and equipment, and other finite life or limited life intangibles like software. So that puts some context to what sort of assets we're talking about in these thresholds. If we move along then um, to the options that are presented in the uh, consultation paper, that top line there is really just for information and comparison. And so it's the, a reminder that the current asset threshold uh, for the review is $20,000 and the current asset threshold for an audit is $100,000. And so the options that will come up in the poll are 2A is to to keep it as equal to the value of the revenue threshold. And that reflects our current approach under the Queensland Act. Option 2B is to double the value of the revenue threshold. And so that's consistent with um, the Corporations Act, but also the threshold that the New South Wales and NT regulators uh, take in their um, acts. And 2C is the write-in option, so if you want to suggest um, and justify an alternative threshold uh, to either of those. And um, I guess importantly, we haven't noted an option there to remove the asset threshold because that's a requirement of the Act and it can't be sort of um, removed by way of regulation. So that's why that one's not there and we should uh, pick a different option that is available. Thank you, Hannah. So. Uh, again, if there's any questions of, of Hannah or um, or Martin for that matter, um, or comments you want to make, please um, share in the chat um, box. Now, uh, as you have no doubt preempted, there's a poll question around the um, around the assets. So, poll three is which approach to asset thresholds is preferred? equal to the value as currently in the Act, double the value uh, of the revenue um, threshold or some other threshold. And if you do choose C, if you could um, provide text on what the other threshold should be. The third part, um, which is the reporting requirements under the Collections Act. No worries. Um, yes, this is... Um I guess reflecting back on that very first slide that we had, um, that there is no thresholds currently applicable for reporting requirements uh, for those fundraisers registered under the Collections Act. And so all of those uh, association or all of those organisations are required to submit an audited annual financial statement uh, to the Office of Fair Trading within seven months of the end of their financial year, that should say. Um, this is a reiteration that uh, from late last month, or sorry, late July, um, those exempt, there is some exempt associations and exempt charities that don't need to lodge uh, financial statements with the Office of Fair Trading any longer if they fulfil their reporting obligations as a registered charity with the ACNC. And so uh, I guess just to keep in mind that you are still required to lodge 
um, certain changes, uh, such as your name, rules, address, office bearers, and whether you are transferred to a company structure. Um, and you need to present uh, those documents that you are required to provide to the ACNC, uh, to your AGM and to your members. And finally, on your annual information statement, which is collected by the ACNC in, and published on the charity register, you need to include your Queensland registration number. Um, there are some caveats to that. So the exemptions won't apply uh, if you're part of an ACNC group reporting arrangement or if you're one of those charities where the ACNC doesn't publish um, your financial reports or certain details such as your revenue on that publicly available charity register. The Amendment Act has uh, introduced a provision that uh, allows um, for some thresholds to be introduced. So that would be similar to those thresholds that we've been going through previously and would give, I guess, some of the smallest fundraisers um, maybe a potential option to reduce the level of verification that they um, are required to, to undertake. Um, that's probably all the context we need for the, for the next section if there's any questions. Um, which is, should all entities who request funds from the public for charitable or community purposes in Queensland be subject to an audit requirement or should an audit threshold apply? Options for your answers there is yes, no, or not sure. And if you then um, have answered that you would like an audit threshold to apply, the question is what should that threshold be, if you could put that in text. Mark, more people are answering. How many audited um, financial um, um, fin you know, financial statements would you receive now un from under the Collections Act? Oh, well, one for every authorised fundraiser, so that's about 4,600 or thereabouts. Um, well, that's uh, until recently. The exemption that was recently put into the Collections Reg as of about the end of July will apply to 75% of those. So they'll only report to ACNC standards and to the ACNC. So, um, yeah, th those who continue to report to Queensland, um, there's only 25% of that number estimated. So, so, so estimated about 1,000? Yeah, I'd say. Do you have any sense of that 1,000, what sort of um, level of revenue it involves? Uh, sorry, I, I don't, unfortunately. Um, no. oh, look, we, we've done a lot of examination of uh, the 75% who report to the ACNC because we can get the those figures there, but um, I might have to take that one on notice. Yeah, no. no, it was just out of interest whether, you know, the what would be the effect or the, um, you know, um, if you applied a threshold, what that would, um, you know, um, how that would align with the thousand that report now. Yeah, yeah. Or probably, that, will, um, that will report after the exemption goes through. Yeah, I'll take that one on notice if I can. We, we do have that info, I just, uh, I'm not sure where, sorry. For those that did respond, no, I might be, a, one thing I didn't pull out of the consultation paper is that, that what happens in other jurisdictions, if you think that would maybe help people with the chat. Yes, yes, if you've got that information. That yes, would yes. Uh, prepared by uh, Martin and his team, so thank you. Um, in the ACT, uh, they require an audit when the annual revenue exceeds $50,000. Uh, this is for fundraisers. Um, in New South Wales, that's when it's over $250,000. South Australia match Queensland where all require an audit. Uh, Victoria is only an audit if you're directed to by the regulator. And in Western Australia, you need an audit um, or a review when it's annual revenue over $250,000. So this now leads us to our um, part part four from the discussion paper, which is the financial documents that must be retained by incorporated associations and Collection Act organisations. And Miles um, will present on this um, part of the discussion paper. Thank you, Miles. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so the 
<clears throat> the amendments to the Associations and Corporations Act and the Collections Act uh, brought the um, the drafting up to date with these sorts of things. Uh, so it uh, it requires the members of the management committee uh, or the controllers of the, the fundraising collection uh, to basically keep appropriate records that explain uh, what is going on in, in the financial affairs of the um, organisation. Um, in years gone by, um, this wasn't the drafting style uh, and uh, there would be specific um, books and ledgers and cash books and uh, journals required. And you can see that in table five of the consultation paper three, if you've got it uh, available to you, they list the um, various uh, books and requirements. Um, and it just, I mentioned that uh, this all came, uh, had something to do with the Metropolitan Streets Act London 1903. Um, and why has something to do with it? For some reason, the drafters uh, copied many of the provisions of that act, which had to do with uh, fundraising on the streets of London in 1903. Um, and it found its way into the Queensland Act and the Western Australian Act. And my favourite provision in the regulations from days gone by of the Collections Act, which were very specific, was that no collector could collect from the public uh, using a box on a long pole. Not any <laughs> pole, but a long pole. Um, and when I, uh, by chance, discovered uh, back in the archives uh, in the British uh, legislation what this was about was there was a common practice on the streets of London uh, to put a collection box on the end of a long pole and uh, go onto the streets and collect from stagecoach windows or people on top of stagecoaches or from terrace uh, house windows, they'd knock on the window with a long pole and a box on it. Um, and this this found its way into the into the regulations here being very specific. Um, of course, I haven't seen any stage coaches going down Queen Street or even the mall uh, very recently. Um, and in fact, um, after an embarrassing situation with the minister and uh, and Ms. Wu who, of the department, uh, at a conference, um, they decided to take it out of the Queensland regulations. But if you look very carefully, it's still there in the Western Australian regulations for fundraising. And this is what happens when you become too specific um, and uh, and uh, don't uh, don't amend and reform the regulations on a regular basis. And given parliamentary time and the time of the department in amending regulations is uh, is scarce. It's best to go with a, a broad, uh, a broad uh, provision rather than specific. We can see some examples of specific um, uh, requirements in the present regulations. Uh, so receipts issued to a, by a collector must be in a bound book form, um, state the full name, yada yada, and be kept on the carbon copy or but numbered but principle. Well. Um, I, I challenge you next time you're in uh, office works uh, to find <laughs> some carbon paper uh, or um, uh, a, um, a book called the Numbered But Principle book. Um, and of course, computing and computers um, have all overrun this, um, and it would be uh, much better to have a more general uh, general provision. My other pet hate, and I, I've been on this for a while. Um, is, and I, I reckon there'd be very few associations in Queensland, I'd be surprised if there were many associations in Queensland, I'll put it that way, uh, who comply with this. Expenditure over $100 must be approved or ratified by the governing body of the charity or association, and it must be recorded in the minute box. Can you imagine some of the associations that are turning over a couple of million bucks um, how big their minute books must be. It must go for volumes uh, if they do, in fact, record this. So um, it's better to be a little more general. And uh, I suspect the way to do it is uh, for the uh, regulator uh, to have a best practice page on their website or in their education material or flyers 
on how to do it for volunteer treasurers, uh, which would um, set out the computer records or or the other hard copy records that they should have. So should the regulations be specific or general? Um, you see, I think that they should be general, but anyway, uh, let's go through uh, the issues. Uh, specific, sure, they'd be helpful to small organisations to know what to do. Um, but as I suggest, um, it really, um, it really is probably better on the uh, web page of the regulator and can be updated as things change, cloud computing and storage and yada, yada, yada. Um, and doesn't require amendment of the regulations, which, which takes time and there may be a, well be a lag. And it may well impose unwarranted costs on larger, larger organisations because it's just not feasible. Um, general allows more flexibility. Um, it syncs better with national requirements. Um, so if you're fundraising in more than one state, um, you've got more likelihood of not having to have special um, documents uh, for Queensland or some other state, but be able to uh, come under the, uh, the general provisions uh, quite adequately. Uh, you can have an OFT practice statement uh, for smaller organisations and volunteers, which is more specific and it's more in line with modern re regulation. So um, those are my views. Um, let's, um, let's not get caught in a collection box on a long pole situation again and be quite embarrassed, um, but let's, let's go specific. Um, but I think it's quite acceptable for the regulator um, to educate uh, volunteer treasurers and the like with some suggestions. Great, so if anyone has any questions, what, a uh, wonderful, wonderful historic um, insights into the uh, into the legislation um, and regulation um, of collections. Perhaps they still have stagecoaches in Western Australia, uh, Miles. Wild West. The yeah. Wild West. The uh, we'll move on to the polls. We've got a number of questions to ask. Um, financial documents um, that must be retained for the purposes of the Collections Act. So the first one is, is it necessary to prescribe specific financial documents that must be retained by incorporated associations and Collection Act organisations, given the broad requirement for those entities to keep financial records that correctly record and explain transactions? That's a yes, no or not sure answer. The next question then is, does prescribing specific documents assist relevant entities in ensuring compliance with the requirement to retain financial records that correctly record and explain transactions? Again, yes, no, or not sure. And the next question is, using the above as a starting point, do the lists of prescribed documents require any adjustment? So what you're asking there, Miles, is does it um, are the documents that listed in line with modern practice? Have other jurisdictions changed theirs to um, accommodate the technical world, Martin? I you? think um, some have, some haven't. Most, I, I think, have to some extent, at least in terms of record keeping. Um, but if you like, after this part, I can give you an update on. Um, what is happening in the world of collection reforms? Uh, so the final one is noting that the list of prescribed documents will apply to all incorporated associations and all Collection Act entities. Does any requirement create an unnecessary burden in terms of national harmonisation? Yes, no or not sure. Thank you, everyone. Um, those um, results will be collated and form part of the feedback in relation to the questions asked in the discussion paper. Now we had a comment um, that I was just going to share um, with you, where it says, just a comment on record keeping. In the regulation, focus on the qualitative attributes of records as evidence and information and purposes for creation, retention and use with reference to mandatory schedule with examples of doc of 
document types developed and issued by the appropriate authority. Focusing on the document form does not align with digital record keeping using applications such as Xero and the complexities associated with cloud-based services where records may actually be stored in other jurisdictions and providers can change or go, on to, um, go out of business. Financial records also beyond traditional accounting and bookkeeping docs and formats. So that's, that's a really great point to make as well. Uh, we've had another comment in relation to the, um, the organisations reporting under the Collections Act. Um, it's that of the thousand continuing to report under the Queensland legislation, we anticipate most would fall into the small category if um, ACNC thresholds, old or new, were adopted. This is, however, based on a view that most large fundraising organisations will be ACNC registered and thus exempt. So we just bear in mind that um, in the feedback that for the Collections Act talking about very small, small organisations is, is this, um, the prediction that um, the department has. The comment from and, Roz. and from Roz, I believe that all meetings should have have printed financial reports that are kept with the minute records. Thanks, thanks for those comments. Now, Martin, um, I will hand over to you um, for uh, further comment and explanations. No worries. Uh, look, just as a general view outside of this discussion paper, as to what's happening in the world of fundraising reform from our perspective. It is, as I think most people, webinar would, would, would acknowledge a, a national issue. National harmonisation is uh, the priority um, and, and probably the key to a, a successful regulation of the, of the sector moving forward. So uh, as you'd all be aware, there's been numerous reports to, to government, particularly the Commonwealth government, uh, that recommend at the end of the day, a single national approach to fundraising laws and uh, it's taken some time but there is um, now a movement afoot on that front and um, it's happening in a sort of piecemeal way in order to um, deliver some relief to the sector as soon as possible. Obviously developing national law will take some time if it's to be done in one big hit so what governments have elected to do is um, firstly deal with the registration and authorisation issue uh, whereby under the law as it currently stands someone with a website with the collect button in South Australia would need a Queensland fundraising approval in order to take a donation from here under the Act. Uh, so a bill was introduced, uh, what was it, May 26, uh, the Casino Control and Other Legislation Amendment Bill, and it contains a, a deemed registration model for, or proposes a deemed registration model for charitable fundraising, whereby if you're ACNC registered, uh, the Queensland government will accept that as uh, as an authority to fundraise in Queensland. You just need to notify the regulator that that's your intention, and you'll be considered a charity registered under the Act. Uh, secondly, so that's that bill hasn't been debated yet. Um, can't say when that will be, but you know we anticipate later this year. Secondly, there's the reporting requirements, which uh, have been different through thresholds and for other reasons. Uh, across other jurisdictions. And again, governments have decided to use ACNC as the, the linchpin for a reform there. And um, as previously mentioned, uh, we've aligned with ACNC thresholds and exempted or by exempting uh, incorporated associations and uh, Collections Act entities from our local reporting requirements in lieu of the ACNC reporting requirements, which achieves harmonisation on the reporting front. And um, lastly, and most significantly, uh, there's work afoot to examine the various fundraising conduct requirements across uh, the various jurisdictions. Uh, that's being done through a national working group. Uh, and um, it, it has had some attention in national cabinet. Uh, it's been listed as one of, uh, publicly as one of 10 uh, priorities um, under the previous Commonwealth government, but uh, it, it has been, been recognised as a priority. So uh, we anticipate some reform will be forthcoming in that space uh, sooner rather than later. And that'll be an opportunity for us to review the uh, Collections Act in a national uh, context and I guess get rid of the other long poles like uh, collecting wearing a mask, which has been a bit of a bugbear for us during COVID. Um, yes. The intent was obviously 
full head koala masks and things like that, I believe, um, when the legislation was drafted. But it's uh, it could be interpreted to prevent someone wearing a, a medical face mask for the purpose of not spreading a disease. It hasn't really been a problem, to be honest, because there are collectors on the street in masks and they're not harassed by police or OFT inspectors, but it is still an issue there in the legislation. So um, hopefully, you know, that may not be the end of it. There'll, there'll need to be possibly uh, further thought around uh, enforcement, compliance, things like that. But there is ongoing work in that space. It is happening nationally and it is happening in a bit of a piecemeal uh, way for the purpose of giving a relief to the sector on various aspects of the thing as we move on. And look, there's, there's still questions uh, that will need to be asked, particularly in that online space that you mentioned earlier, the issue of GoFundMe and, and things like that. Again, it's borderless, requires a national approach and would best be dealt with nationally. So um, that's where, where that's at. Thank you for the update, Martin. That's very encouraging, very encouraging from my perspective. Others, um, I, hope, I hope they see it the same. Uh, we've got a, um, a question. I just uh, have a question for you. Is there any thought on developing a digital ID for incorporated associations that will create a profile for all government and compliance requirements in a profile such as uh, the Office of Fair Trading, Child Protection, Licensing, Government Grants, etc.? This would assist with succession in organisations. Yeah, I can see how it would. Yes, um, look, I'll have to take that on board. That's probably a question for our ops people. I'm not aware of anything, but it is it is possible. There's always work afoot in that space. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question, Gavin. Great question. Um, now, it's um, that brings us to the end of this webinar and to the end of our webinar series. Thank you to all that made this possible, and particularly thank you for the department to. Uh, made the time and uh, staff to uh, come along to answer any questions that uh, may be posed to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to Hannah, your presentation in our um, second um, webinar. Yesterday's uh, webinar and today has been um, fantastic, very informative, and we're very thankful for the work that you've put in um, and all that you do for the sector. Is there anything you wanted to um, say just to, to wrap it up at all? Uh, no, nothing. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I love, I can talk about not-for-profits and, and whatnot all day, so thank you. Uh, I just simply wanted to thank uh, all of our speakers and to say that Miles started this centre 21 years ago, as you can see from the bottom corner of our slides, and has always been about taking evidence and research and being a space for um, honest conversations about things that will improve our sector. ACPNES is about knowledge impact for a better world. And I think these, these series of uh, seminars and the fact that they've been peopled by our wonderful alumni as speakers uh, like Hannah and Jackie and others, uh, we really do um, you know, take that pretty seriously. Thank you very much for your participation. And we hope that you use the range of resources that sit within ACPNS for free use. Uh, Miles's legal cases that you can subscribe to for free are a great example if your organisation doesn't know about that yet. Thank you, Linda, for chairing. Thank you. Uh, Linda, can I just express the department's gratitude to QUT again, uh, just to reiterate David's comments from yesterday and to all the participants, thanks very much. Um, as David said, we're very reliant on you for telling us what we don't know and uh, we'll be guided by you in submissions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Actually, uh, Martin, while we've got you there, uh, with the, the submissions are due the 12th of September, what do you anticipate the time frame to be in, in before the, um, up to the regulation being tabled? I can't say for certain. Um, we've got a few things emerging at the moment, but um, I, I think we'd like to have it underway very early in 2014 uh, would be the goal, if not late this year. I think early 2014 is probably a more realistic goal. Okay. And we will, of course, 2024, like you mean? 2024? Sorry, yes. Yeah, early, hopefully. Um, but uh, we're, we're cognizant of things like the grievance procedure and disclosure remuneration that uh, associations will need um, a lot of advanced time to work out if they want to use the model procedure or develop their own. So we'll be looking at 
possibly tabling a regulation that commences sometime down the track. Um, maybe a year, if we can give them a year, we will. Right, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you.